We're now going to go into some conditions of the elderly. Uh, again, a different group. Again, I've tried to group these into common areas. Of course, it's a continuation from childhood into adolescence, into young adulthood, to older adulthood, and into the elderly, that depending on the patient's physiology and overall health, what does, what does it mean to be elderly? Well, that's anywhere from probably over 50 to over 100, depending on uh, the patient you're seeing. So it, it's a huge variation. And some patients do very, very well throughout life with their spine and never really have any issues, which speaks to the overall diversity within uh, patient populations and the difficulty in trying to study any one of these things um, and make the studies valid uh, in terms of external validity because there are such a heterogeneous group of patients. The first thing I want to talk about is lumbar stenosis. It's extremely common and you're going to see a lot of it. Lumbar stenosis is a process by which the discs over time degenerate and lose height, the facets degenerate and hypertrophy is part of that degenerative process and through that uh, loss of height of the discs the mild instability and loss of height of the facets and the hypertrophy of the facet capsule as well as the relative shortening of the uh, ligamentum flavum all of this starts to crowd the lumbar canal typically and this leads to potential compression within the foramen within the lateral recess of the canal and of the cauda equina. This rarely causes cauda equina syndrome. This typically causes neurogenic claudication, which is pain in the legs with walking. There's two common causes of claudication, vascular claudication and neurogenic claudication. Vascular claudication is caused by a lack of blood supply to the lower limbs. Uh, neurogenic is caused by compression of the nerves in the lumbar spine. So your vascular claudication is gonna be patients that are at risk for peripheral vascular disease and they will typically talk about uh, pain in the legs after a certain period of time, five to 10 minutes, usually worse going uphill. Um, patients with neurogenic claudication will talk about uh, similar that after five to 10 minutes they get pain in their legs, but it's Im significantly improved when they can lean forward. Leaning forward opens up the canal. So if they can lean forward on a shopping trolley or on a cane or crutches, they say that makes it feel much better and they can usually walk a little bit longer. The vascular claudicant will sit down on a park bench and they know that they can walk for 10 minutes, get to park bench one, sit for 10 minutes, then they can make it to park bench two and sit for another 10 minutes. The neurogenic claudicant tends not to be quite as uh, time specific with their history, but again, it can be variable. And of course, in many of these elderly, uh, elderly patients, they will have potentially components of both, that many elderly patients uh, who are chronic smokers or potentially diabetics will be at risk for vascular claudication and may also have a component of neurogenic claudication, which makes the history and physical exam very tricky. The differential diagnosis, of course, we have to look at the hips, knees, ankles uh, for potential sources of osteoarthritis, as that could be the cause of their leg pain. We have to rule out the vascular claudication. On examination, rarely in the clinic will you find any focal neurologic deficits. These aren't patients that have a foot drop. They're not patients that have a focal decrease sensation that if you're seeing a stalking uh, decrease sensation, look out for some early or potentially some diabetes. Um, if they've got hair loss, poor pulses, then you're looking for vascular claudication. Imaging, start off with your plain x-rays and look at their spinal balance. So don't just get x-rays of the lumbar spine, get x-rays of their entire spine. Again, EOS scan optimally that you wanna see where their head is in space and how much loss of lumbar lordosis progressive kyphosis is affecting their overall alignment. You may also want to image their hips if you're worried about hip arthritis. If you're worried about vascular claudication then getting vascular studies of the limbs, Doppler, Doppler ultrasound, or potentially an MRI of the lumbar spine to look for stenosis in the lumbar spine. Mainstay of treatment is first off easy stuff, uh, walking aids, crutch, cane, walker, something to help their uh, balance. Um, Activity, hydrotherapy, tai chi, yoga, simple back exercises to try to keep them as mobile as possible. Um, keeping the elderly population mobile help decrease the risk of falls, decrease, decrease the risk of hip fracture, wrist fracture, uh, compression fracture of their spine. These are all really important things. Avoiding narcotics in the elderly is ideal. It's sometimes very difficult that um, neurofin 
acetaminophen might not be enough. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, acetaminophen and norepinephrine is an Australian drug. Sorry, uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen might not be enough. Um, they might have liver disease from alcoholism. They might have kidney disease from diabetes. That there's going to be many reasons why some medications aren't appropriate in these patients. And narcotics cause a great deal of problems within the elderly population, increase the risk of falls, um, increase uh, medical comorbidities. And so we really have to be careful with the medical treatment uh, in these patients. Surgery for decompression of the lumbar spine is extremely effective, but of course, surgery in the elderly population also comes with a risk profile. And so it's weighing the pros and cons of surgery and discussing that with the patient and their families and getting a clear idea of the goals of surgery that sometimes a simple laminectomy will be enough to achieve their uh, the goals of decompression of the spinal canal. If they have significant deformity along with the stenosis, then they may require a much larger surgery to realign their spine. Um, otherwise, a simple laminectomy may not achieve the goals of surgery. And so dosing surgery to what the patient needs and is able to tolerate is extremely important. I've put up x-rays of an example of a patient's lumbar spine that uh, resulted in uh, stenosis and this uh, can cause a significant amount of claudication and it's a discussion with these patients as to how much surgery is necessary. Um, epidural steroids do have some role although that's again questionable and Dosing your uh, therapy to the patient will be dependent on multiple factors. Osteoporotic compression fractures are extremely common, uh, usually typically low energy. These are stable fractures. Be highly suspicious in uh, acute back pain in the elderly population with a small fall, down the steps, slip in the bathroom, and x-ray will typically show um, a compression fracture and wedging of a vertebra and potentially they will have more than one. Watch out for patients with spondyl arthropathy, ankylosing spondylitis, as what you may think is a compression fracture is potentially could be an unstable, uh, what we call carrot stick fracture or three column fracture that may require surgical stabilization. Typically compression fractures require no surgical stabilization. The role for vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty is extremely uh, uh, controversial. Continuing on with osteoporotic compression fractures, the mainstay of treatment for the compression fractures is going to be uh, both treating the osteoporosis and treating the fracture. So of course treating the osteoporosis, we want to try to prevent future fractures, try to prevent uh, future hip fractures or wrist fractures, so roll for bisphosphonates and then calcium and vitamin D. And that's going to be managed either by yourself or by the patient's family doctor. Treatment of the compression fracture is going to be pain control and time. That these rarely need surgery. Bracing is rarely indicated. Occasionally it can be useful to uh, give them a brace if mobilizing is difficult. But most of the time these patients should be able to get up and get mobilizing uh, within a few days. The, uh, of course, also the assessment for why they're having a fall uh, will be important to try to prevent future fractures. The x-ray on slide 33 uh, demonstrates a classic uh, superior plate compression fracture of L2. And one of the things that differentiates this from a burst fracture is that you'll notice on the AP radiograph, the pedicles are not widened that this is a low energy injury that uh, rarely requires um, anything more than supportive management. Adult spinal deformity, which is the next topic, is a very large topic that uh, I could spend easily over an hour on and uh, only gets two slides, so we'll go into it a little bit again. This is what we've talked about uh, already. It's all about balance, uh, having the head balanced over the pelvis. Life is a kyphosing event that as the discs degenerate, as the facets degenerate, this uh, causes the head to tilt forward. Uh, 
combine that with a bit of hip arthritis and the patient's uh, mechanisms to compensate for uh, their degenerative process get worse and worse. It's important to assess where the patient's having pain, where they may be weak, and if they have any aspects of neurogenic claudication or any radiculopathy that are going along with this. But the main state of treatment, of course, is trying to keep the patient upright, uh, mobilizing with activities, physiotherapy, hydrotherapy, uh, whatever uh, exercises they're able to do and that they can enjoy. Uh, pain medications play a role to help them. Uh, walking aids will be very important. Bracing is controversial. Bracing uh, does cause weakness, and weakness is our enemy here. The role for surgery is um, really to reestablish spinal balance, and it's a matter of dosing surgery enough to achieve spinal balance uh, while recognizing that many elderly patients may be too frail to undergo a major um, spinal realignment surgery. The slide 35 gives an example of a degenerative uh, lumbar scoliosis in the setting of a baseline idiopathic scoliosis that uh, later in life has uh, decompensated. And that patient is slowly tilting forward both due to the loss of their lumbar lordosis and overall poor sagittal balance and they're now decompensating. That if they're medically well enough to undergo surgery to uh, realign the spine and reachieve balance, uh, fantastic, then that's certainly an option. If they're medically too unfit to undergo surgery, then you have to consider what are the other options uh, from a conservative management standpoint to uh, help optimize their day-to-day uh, -day life. The next topic that again we'll just touch on metastatic, metastatic spine disease is extremely common within the cancer population. 90% of patients that die from cancer will have metastatic disease to their spine. The cancers that most commonly metastasize to bone are your uh, paired organs, lungs, breast, prostate, kidney. But it's certainly not limited to those that we also see it with uh, bowel cancer. Um, myeloma uh, would be another uh, common cancer to bone. So uh, really any cancer can metastasize to bone and a spine is one of the most common in sites to uh, have metastases due to uh, the uh, high blood supply to the vertebral bodies. This often leads to compression fractures, which uh, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate a osteoporotic compression fracture from a metastatic compression fracture. And it's really based on MRI, or sorry, uh, based on history initially, finding out a history of cancer. And if they don't uh, have any history, then some of these patients um, will be diagnosed initially with a compression fracture when is, this could be an initial presentation of a MET. Um, the only really way to know for sure is of course getting more advanced imaging, CT scan, MRI. Uh, if you're worried about multiple bony metastases, then this is where bone scan pl can play an important role. And then the more advanced imaging as well, your uh, PET scans, spec CTs may play a role in those patients' workup in conjunction uh, or in collaboration with their uh, oncologist and their spine surgeon, depending on what the treatment modalities are gonna be for this patient. Uh, again, getting an idea of the patient's prognosis is gonna help uh, align therapy. If they have any signs of uh, neurogenic uh, compression, either in the spinal cord or in the cauda equina, then surgical decompression can play an important role if they're fit to undergo surgery. Uh, in the absence of neurologic signs or symptoms, then uh, it's an assessment of whether or not the spine is potentially unstable due to, due to the metastases and whether or not surgical um, stabilization may be important. Really, this is going to be a multidisciplinary approach to these patients that are very complex, and the key is recognizing which patients are at highest risk, and that's the, the patients with a history of cancer or that you suspect may uh, have a first presentation of cancer. Uh, based on other frailty indexes that you uh, may use. Slide 37 shows an example of uh, metastatic lesion to L4. Uh, both on CT scan and an MRI, you see marked uh, changes to the uh, signal in the vertebral body, and it's causing some stenosis in the uh, central lumbar canal. 
This is an example of a patient that had a uh, history of breast cancer. Uh, this is a patient that uh, may benefit from uh, local decompression and then stabilization from L3 to L5. But again, that has to be uh, done in conjunction with discussions with the patient as well as the oncology team, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and understanding the patient's prognosis and what they want and how symptomatic they are. That kind of covers a great deal of uh, what I wanted to talk about uh, today. Of course, this is, like I said, this is by no means an exhaustive list of causes of back pain or conditions within thoracolumbar spine. These are some common things that you're going to see that are worthwhile knowing more about. And this summary hopefully is, uh, starts you off on giving a general idea of things that, uh, to look out for. Thank you very much.